It's my honor to introduce our final presenter, Alan Mather. Alan Mather is principal of Lindblom Math and Science Academy, uh, a Chicago public selective enrollment school. He was recently awarded the inaugural Stanley C. Golder Award for principals and heads of schools by the Golden Apple Foundation, uh, a tremendous honor. Uh, having begun as an English teacher, he now has over 28 years of experience teaching and administering in Chicago public schools. And today he will be leading uh, a conversation and interaction, a presentation on energy and the environment, a problem-based learning approach. Please join me in welcoming Alan Mather. And I have been a teacher um, recently enough that I know how awesome it is to finish things off. It's kind of like eighth period before spring break. So uh, please know that it will not be me talking for uh, an hour. A great deal of interaction. There's going to be some reading, a little bit of talking, but um, we'll be doing lots of different things. So before anything else, I want you to think a little bit about the neighborhood that your school is in. Uh, my school is in West Englewood. Uh, West Englewood is due west of here, about five miles. Um, the school's at 61st, Cut, which is almost at Damon. Um, West Englewood is a vastly underserved community, and, and we're thinking about an environmental issue that may be important to either your students or your community. Um, in West Englewood, we have a huge issue with lead in the soil. Um, in a food desert, this is especially problematic because when people want to grow food to eat, this is, is an issue if everything is leached with lead. So um, raised gardens are a big piece, but early on we were working with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency and said, well, you know, what are some things we can do? Well, you could go test the soil. Well, but if you go and test the soil and it's somebody's home and you find lead, then there's an abatement issue. And you know, lots of complexity around this. So we haven't charged full force into um, working with the community in the same way. And we're thinking about how to do this going forward still. So we, we have a problem that we're working on now. But you have pads of paper in front of you that you all came with and or received, as well as a writing utensil. So would you take a few minutes to think about this and to write a little bit, just two or three minutes? on those environmental issues that would be important to your students or community. So when you're thinking about how to turn a problem into a learning opportunity for students, there are a lot of things we have to think of, right? One is right here. As we're designing our lessons, right? Lots and lots of stuff. Here you have the top three examples. I am using laser pointers. Um, eighth grade math from the Common Core, language arts writing from the Common Core, reading in history from Common Core, and this is uh, from the Next Generation Science Standards. Read over those for a moment. These, of course, don't have to be used. These are just examples. But when designing the lesson, certainly we know that these skills we are teaching have to build on other skills. The content is the way to get to the skills, but it's the skills we're working to, to build and create. I will do my little plug bit. I don't think this is a federal takeover of education. Common Core. I would argue that we do too much testing around it, but I don't think the standards themselves are a problem. But, but it makes sense and things you would do in school, right? So how does this problem become a problem statement? So again, we want to think about how learners, our students, want to investigate real world problems. If it is an exercise that has no connection to life whatsoever, the question is, why are we doing this? They should have a sense of urgency about what they're doing, about finding out what the problem is, and figuring out how to be part of that solution. And as teachers, we all know 
this is uncomfortable. It can be messy and long. We have uh, belief statements that drive what we do at Lynn Bloom. Included in that are we are all teachers and learners, and we learn as much from failure as we do from success. We're talking about changing it to learn, we learn more from failure than we do from success, and driving into um, how it's okay to fail. So we want to create an essential question, right? Key parts of an essential question. The question must be controversial. It has to spark students' interests. There have to be multiple solutions to this essential question, different ways to attack it. Students have to be able to consider those options, weigh those options, support with evidence, and justify whatever answer they've come up with. And ideally, in our perfect world, this can be attacked from multiple disciplines. We would love to see English, math, science, and social studies, just how the last slide showed those three common core strands and one next generation science standard. We would love to be able to attack it from all different areas. Right now at Lynn Bloom, one of the things we have are houses. All of our seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th graders are in a house, and those houses have the same English, math, science, and social, the students have the same English, math, science, and social studies teachers as the other students in that house. They have common planning time, gives them an opportunity to work together and think about how they can create opportunities for students to integrate their learning, get away from siloing education, which we know is, again, a huge problem. So I'm gonna ask you to take those statements you have, those, uh, that you, those problems you came up with your own, in your own communities, and in your groups, I guess they don't necessarily have to be four or five, I wasn't sure how big the tables were gonna be set up, but I understand you've already been divided appropriately. Um, is that right? In, by, grade level. by grade level, okay. We're not there yet, we're, we moved to our grade level. Oh, okay, well, share your own issue that you wrote about on your own right now with those, share those neighborhood issues what those issues are, and let's come to a consensus at each table on which problem we want to focus on. Let's take about five minutes for that and see if we need more time. But five minutes of discussion, go. All right, that's seven minutes. Let's, uh, let's come back together for a moment. I went backwards for a bit. So the next thing we're going to try to do is map a little complexity into this problem. Generally, if it's a problem that's going to be interesting to students, there are a lot of moving pieces, just like the, the very brief example I gave of lead in the soil in West Inglewood. So when, think about when one part is moved, what other parts are acted upon, right? What policy comes into play? How does this affect politicians? What are the, what's the real science behind it? How does it affect homeowners in the community as with the lead issue? And I want you to try to do one of two things, give you a, a couple of options here. All of you have um, white paper in the middle of your table, just some blank paper can draw on, whatever. But think about a concept map, and I put a couple of examples up here. My um, drawing skills leave a lot to be desired. I will share that. Um, but one is, is just a basic concept map. And what are, if you choose to do this, what is the issue here in the center, right? What's the issue, the problem you're trying to solve? And then what are those forces acting on it or that are affected by it? And where are there places where they overlap? This is this, it's a very simple thing, but it's a very difficult thing to do, right? 
The other here is the root cause analysis. And I think especially for the younger kids, but I have to say our high school kids have been in a couple of classes where my teachers have done this with students and high school kids dig it too. The big issue is here, this is the trunk, right? These are the symptoms of that issue and here are the root causes. And just having students do this gets them to another place. So again, you have now a problem that your table has decided to work on. And we're going to do something a little different with this in a bit, but just to give you a start, choose one of these ways, map, root cause analysis, um, play with that at your table. Again, this will take another 10 minutes of your time to really kind of look at the intricacies. And we won't get to everything, <laughs> and that's okay. But let's take about 10 minutes to go through and see how far you can get on one of these two approaches. So I'm going to ask you to sit and percolate on this for a couple of minutes as we, um, I want to talk about a couple things we've done at Lynn Bloom with this specifically to give some concrete examples. Um, anybody here know of the ILIT project, Illinois Innovation Talent Project? So um, you know the big kind of gurus, right, in problem-based learning in the state. It's Illinois uh, Math and Science Academy, IMSA, and they've done a lot of training, the PBL network there. And for a while, they had a program where they connected corporate and university partners with high schools. Um, and people would present a problem, a problem to those students, and the students would work on it. Um, our very first one, we have a relationship with Baxter International, the pharmaceutical company. And our very first problem with them was there's been a huge increase in juvenile diabetes, right? Baxter creates the home dialysis machine, but it's just for adults. And so with this incredible influx, they weren't trying to cure juvenile diabetes. They were saying, how do we make this accessible to students or to children? How do we get the, the medication right? Because right now the only size bag they had was for adults and it just wasn't meeting the needs of who their customers were. And they did a wonderful thing where they sent out not only scientists to meet with our students, but also people in marketing and design um, to, to meet with all different groups of students. And the students eventually got to present their prototype to the CEO of Baxter. So it was an exciting thing for them. But this has kind of morphed into something new. It is now the R&D STEM Learning Exchange, which um, started out kind of as I lit, but then underwent a sort of metamorphosis um, as part of the Clinton Global Initiative. And companies, again, packed in. You can see this is the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition, ISTE. Um, so the, they have had Baxter, IIT with iFish, um, Northrop Grumman, um, a number of companies that have put out to schools these problem challenges and schools, many, sometimes multiple schools will work on the same project, problem challenge and then attack it in very, very different ways. So I'm gonna, now it's time for a little reading, but reading on the screen, again, I, I'm gonna give you some paper, some other paper, but I decided this, I just throw up on the screen um, this is the most recent problem we received from Baxter. It's four slides, so. Okay. 
okay to go on? Okay to go on? Ready for the last one? So you can see it's really broad, right? Really, really broad. We had just a couple of examples, pre-engineering students who got the plans for the building, because the building had been rehabbed from 03 to 05, and looked at the airflow in the building to see whether that could have some impact on um, disease, the spread of disease and infection. Um, they, oh my gosh, they went in so many different directions, but what they ended up doing was, not video sensors, but just putting sensors at the boys and girls washrooms to see how often people went in and out and put sensors on the hot and cold water in the sinks and they were able to actually track how often students wash their hands after going to the bathroom <laughs> and had some disturbing findings but um, <laughs> actually my guess <laughs> but um, but you know, because they had done the work and the data and presented the data to the school, this had an impact from surveys before to surveys after of what students were doing. We actually didn't have the same sensors there because um, somebody ended up taking the sensors in the bathroom doors. We knew how much hand washing was going on afterwards, but we didn't know how often people went in and out. There was an increase in hand washing, but we don't know if that just meant there were way more people going to the bathroom or, or not, but we don't think so. Um, but it, it took a long time. It took a long time for kids to go into these different avenues and these different solutions to try to come up with some way to deal that was innovative, effective, feasible for decreasing illness and the spread of infection. They looked at antibacterial versus non-antibacterial soaps, because it's a huge issue now as well, right? Spread of infection. So um, it was wonderful for them, and then everybody who was part of the um, R&D STEM Learning Exchange went to the Museum of Science and Industry and presented their findings. Um, to students. There were only 20 schools this year in Illinois that were part of it, although it's expanding for next year. But it's just a great way for kids to get real world science learning. In that case, science, but there were also surveys. So they used psychology classes to come up with the appropriate types of surveys to ask. There was, in, in art class, marketing for hand washing materials afterwards. So they use their art skills. So it can be interdisciplinary. So now I'm going to give you something else to read. But this is going to be a, a reading on your own. Anybody know this? The Pixar pitch? Daniel Pink's uh, Art of Persuasion. So I'd everybody grab one. Just take a few minutes to read. So you have done some pre-work already, right? You have found a problem, you have found issues. Now it's time to put it into a narrative form or have students put it into a narrative form where they're gonna be excited about what the outcome is and what they're gonna investigate. So, I shouldn't put this down. Now with your problem, create your own narrative of this at your table. Once upon a time there was, use this as a model. Every day, one day, because of that, because of that, until finally. See if you can come up with that for your own problem statement. We're gonna share these in a bit. 
So I think we're going to start with 15 minutes and see how that goes. All right, everyone, could we at this point, hi, that's okay, finish up. <laughs> um, there's one group still working. Everybody stare at them until they're done. No, um, we're, going to, um, we're going to do a little gallery walk. Everybody has either green or pink Post-its at their tables. Just want you right now to walk around, look at people's stories, any notes you might want to write to the authors of that story. Feel free about how effective you think this would be with students, or just kind of your general impression of this. Go for it. Give, give them your two cents. And let's come back again in about seven minutes. Oh. <laughs> All right, any, uh, any reflections on what you've just done? Ideas of how this could or could not be used in your classrooms? Um, I, I guess uh, an observation occurred to me, and it, was, it surprised me that it didn't occur to me, and I also noticed in the other groups that after our conversation on solar panels and the broader cost of issues, like right now we're talking about the city, that it seemed that nobody said, um, like for example, we talked about air quality, so we're talking about factories, and it didn't occur to us to say, and the factory paid the hospital bill. Like, and I, I guess it, I'm reflecting on everybody, all, all the group's um, outcomes, that nobody said anything like that. Just to, to follow up, it, looking at them, I mean, many of us, we saw city government or government in some ways to be the gateway to making these, you, know, you take a petition, you demand from your elected officials change. But you're right, there wasn't sort of an awareness of corporate responsibility or the responsibility of the wrongdoer to pay up the hidden costs. But I, but I said, if you look at Pixar, I'm sorry, there isn't an evil doer who's punished in the end. The whole, all these stories are about the characters transforming themselves. That's really the whole point. It's, you know, um, what's his name? Nemo and his dad are different at the end. Okay, the toys are different at the end. Nothing worse. <laughs> Sorry. And they can't cut you off. person uh, got sick from the dirt? Oh, too much junk. Oh, 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 the junk food, okay. Some element of learning and changing behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They flourished. They flourished. They flourished, yes, they flourished, flourished, yes. Did you? Yes. Um, I, I think Something that I'm personally thinking about, and I was aware of this when we were constructing the different steps of our story, is um, it was easy to identify like this idyllic um, outcome of the effort, but it was harder to come up with 
the, because of that portion. So like what was necessary to get to that idyllic outcome. Um, and I think for me personally, that's like a stress that I have and a difficulty I have as an instructor is what are the solutions. And I imagine that students would also have difficulty with that. So the activity kind of brought those concerns to the forefront of my mind personally. I, I just think, you know, this reflects more of our tone. And, you know, I've taught in college and high school for a long time, and I, I don't know why we wouldn't have more play involved with, you know, an inspiration like the Lorax or something where this might be more of an activity. Yeah, you can do the research, and, you know, and you can approach it like a real project-based, serious study. But I think you need to start with just completely playful imagination goofiness. I think that, for us, that worked better. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit more inspiring for a kid, you know? It started as a, just a storytelling situation. What if? What if we did that? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And this is where the discomfort comes in with so many teachers, right? I don't know where to go with this. And you are turning things over to kids. And can you see in this the different disciplines that can be addressed? I mean, you've already talked about the politics. We've certainly talked about science. Do you see where other pieces fit into this? I mean, each one of these, I think, had a, could have a multidisciplinary approach where kids attack things from a different side, but you don't have the answers. And what a beautiful thing that is. <laughs> and what a terrifying thing that is as a teacher, right? I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know what they're going to take. And it is really, really messy for a while. But if kids do care about it, and they see this as something that they want to realize, this is the jumping off point. Right? This is not the finish. So how do we get here? How do we get to this spot where we have these sort of playgrounds and we know this has to happen and this has to happen now? Figure out how we get there. And I'm going to support you and I'm going to help guide you and I'm going to get you to that place. But that's a great deal of what we've gone through today as a group. right? As well as the simple things like, it's a 90 minute class and my god, you don't want to sit the whole time. Right? So finding ways to get that interactive, to get kids talking to each other, to switch activities that you're doing from reading to writing to discussing to doing a gallery walk, independent work, group work, all of it is part of it. And this, in 90 minutes, we're not going to get a whole heck of a lot done on this. But this is the time where I hope if you saw things that were interesting, you're taking out your phones and you're taking pictures and saying, this is how I can take this back. Just like you would have kids take their phones out and take pictures of things they put up on the wall that, that may spark them. Any other final thoughts? I know I'm uh, about done with my time, and I, I know you want to stay here as long as possible. I, I feel it. Yes. Well, I was just going to say that this is wonderful, but I think it has to be done. What I feel is here is a climate of trust people be, would feel safe doing this, you know, and unfortunately, I feel, maybe other people don't have this experience, that with this assessment-driven, I don't even know what you want to call it, climate, mm -hmm. that teachers are afraid more of that than of giving power or sharing power or whatever you want to call it with the students. You know, it's, it's what if and always being evaluated and the informals and the formals and so people try to control more of what they can rather than suppress creativity. About it. And it suppresses the joy and the play. I think when you're talking about a reach observation and uh, Chicago Public Schools evaluation process, this is where when students take control where things turn out higher. I think the, the culture you build in your classroom is a different thing as well as the top-down management that happens in a lot of schools with the control, compliance, and coercion, the big three C's of education. And right, this is breaking out of the three C's, and I think there has to be a justification made that this is right for kids. And you know, we, we make this argument all the time. We know that test prep does not work, right? 
the more test prep you do, the worse students do. So why do we get them to hate school? Why do we get them to, to not want to come? Instead, we should be engaging them at a very high level. And this takes them to different levels. Things like this take them to different levels without the, yeah, you can still give them questions every once in a while that look like NWEA or ACT or whatever, but that should not be the model that we use. I know, no, if we're dealing with uh, what should happen, maybe not what always is. Right. Yes. I think what's been beneficial to me, just not only about these three days that I've experienced, but also in the most recent PDs that I've taken, you have to step in with the mindset of a learner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that was the hardest thing for me to let go. Don't come in as an educational professional. Don't come in as a person in the know on things because they talked about, um, you know, from, from certain um, activities that, that were done. If you're thinking from the teaching perspective, then you're missing the point because all the questions that you have to ask that are probing questions to the students are going to be based upon their perspective. And, and not yours. You know, it, it, it's just going to happen that way because then that's when you're going to pull the information from them. Because my students would just close up. You know, if, if I'm way, way out there on them, they're just going to close up. But I notice that when I loosen up and I get into their world, then it's it's from a down here perspective, and they're just talking and doing. It. And obviously, instructionally, too, with what we did here, there was not a great deal of scaffolding because the assumption was that you <laughs> were going to be able to run with this. And, and certainly, with different grades, there would be much more of that. But um, this was uh, knowing that you had educators who were all coming to the University of Chicago for PD, <laughs> knowing, knowing who, you were, uh, who your audience is, too, right? Right. But it, is, it, is, um, it can be transformative in teaching. Well. Okay, well, let us thank Alan Mather. All right, thank you.